Turrets are rotating weapons platforms that allow gunners to fire at enemy aircraft from different angles and directions. They were widely used on bombers and some fighters during the Second World War as a means of self-defense and offensive fire. In this video, we will explore the history and importance of turrets in World War II aircraft and answer some of the following questions. How did turrets develop and change over time? What were the advantages and disadvantages of different types of turrets? How effective were turrets in combat against enemy fighters? How did different air forces and manufacturers approach the design and installation of turrets? What were the challenges and limitations of turret technology and warfare? Let's find out. Turret development in the 1930s. The idea of mounting guns on rotating platforms dates back to the First World War, but it was not until the 1930s that turrets became more advanced and widespread. New, modern bombers were built with powered turrets installed, which used electric or hydraulic motors to move the guns and the platform. The belief was that the bomber with the new turrets could defeat any fighter attack and reach its target. The powered turrets were marvels of technology and design, incorporating features such as gyro stabilization, automatic fire control, and remote sighting. Some of the most famous examples of bombers with powered turrets were the British Vickers Wellington and the American Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. The Vickers Wellington was a twin-engine medium bomber that entered service in 1938. It had a distinctive geodetic airframe that made it very resilient to damage. It also had four turrets, a nose turret with two 7.7mm machine guns, a tail turret with four 7.7mm machine guns, and two beam turrets with one 7.7mm machine gun each. The beam turrets were mounted on the sides of the fuselage and could be rotated to cover the upper and lower arcs. The Wellington could carry up to 4,500 pounds, 2,000 kilograms, of bombs and had a range of 2,550 miles, 4,100 kilometers. The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress was a four-engine heavy bomber that entered service in 1939. It was one of the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War and participated in many strategic bombing missions over Europe and the Pacific. It had a crew of 10 and was armed with 13 12.7 mm machine guns in five turrets and two waist positions. The turrets were a nose turret with two guns, a dorsal turret with two guns, a ventral turret with two guns, and two tail turrets with two guns each. The ventral turret, also known as the ball turret, was a spherical enclosure that could rotate 360 degrees and had a remote sighting system. The B-17 could carry up to 8,000 pounds, 3,600 kilograms, of bombs and had a range of 2,000 miles, 3,200 kilometers. The Failure of the Self-Defending Bomber The theory of the self-defending bomber was shattered in combat in early 1939 when the German Luftwaffe launched a series of devastating raids on British and French targets the turret was not the answer to swift, heavily armed fighters and never would be. The British realized that their bombers were vulnerable and ineffective in daylight and turned to night bombing to protect their crews and aircraft. The Americans, however, clung to their belief in the self-defending bomber well into 1943 when they suffered heavy losses in their daylight bombing campaign over Europe. The turret firepower was insufficient to deter or destroy the enemy fighters, which could outmaneuver and outgun the bombers. One of the first examples of the failure of the self-defending bomber was the Battle of the Heligoland Bight on December 18, 1939. A force of 24 British Wellington bombers attacked German naval targets in the North Sea, but were intercepted by about 100 German fighters. The Wellingtons had only two turrets each, and their guns jammed frequently. The German fighters attacked from the front and below, where the bombers had no defensive fire. The result was a disaster for the British. Twelve bombers were shot down, six were badly damaged, and only one reached its target. The Germans lost only two fighters. 
Another example was the Operation Millennium on May 30 and 31, 1942. This was the first thousand bomber raid by the British on the German city of Cologne. The raid was a success in terms of damage and morale, but it also exposed the limitations of the British turrets. The bombers were mostly unescorted and faced about 300 German fighters. The turrets had a limited field of fire and could not cope with the high closing speeds and angles of the fighters. The bombers also had to fly in a tight formation to avoid friendly fire, which made them easier targets. The British lost 40 bombers and 153 crewmen, while the Germans lost 27 fighters. The most notorious example of the failure of the self-defending bomber was the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission on August 17, 1943. This was a daring attempt by the U.S. AAF to strike the German ball-bearing factories in Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt aircraft plant in Regensburg. The mission involved 376 B-17 flying fortresses, which had to fly deep into Germany without fighter escort. The B-17s had 13 machine guns in five turrets and were considered the best defended bombers in the world. However, they met fierce resistance from about 300 German fighters, which attacked them from all directions. The B-17s could not fend off the fighters and suffered heavy losses. 60 bombers were shot down, 138 were damaged, and 552 crewmen were killed, wounded, or captured. The Germans lost only 25 fighters. These examples show that the concept of the self-defending bomber was flawed and unrealistic. The turret was not a magic weapon that could protect the bombers from the enemy fighters. The bombers needed fighter escorts to survive and succeed in their missions. The turret development in the 1930s was a technological achievement, but also a strategic mistake. The Evolution of American Power Turrets Despite the failure of the self-defending bomber, the Americans continued to develop and improve their power turrets throughout the war. The archetypal U.S. World War II bomber turret swung a pair of 50 caliber machine guns, which had a longer range and higher impact than the British 303 machine guns. Companies including Sperry, Bendix, Emerson, General Electric, Martin, and Consolidated designed power turrets for American bombers, each with their own characteristics and capabilities. The power tail turret first seen on the B-24C was a 1941 in-house design by Consolidated's B-24 Armament Group. It was later replaced by the Emerson A-15 turret, which had a better field of fire and visibility. The B-17 used the Sperry ST-325 turret, which had a distinctive teardrop shape and a periscopic sight. Some of the most innovative and advanced power turrets were developed by General Electric. The GEB-22 turret was a remotely controlled computer-aimed turret that used a radar system to track and fire at enemy aircraft. It was mounted on the B-29 Super Fortress and the B-36 Peacemaker and could fire four 50 caliber machine guns or two 20 millimeter cannons. The GEB-29 turret was a similar system, but used a television camera instead of a radar to sight the target. It was also mounted on the B-29 and the B-36 and had two 20 millimeter cannons. These turrets were the predecessors of modern fire control systems. Another notable power turret was the Martin CE-250 upper turret, which was used on the B-26 Marauder and the B-25 Mitchell, it was a hydraulically powered turret that had two 50 caliber machine guns and a reflector sight. It was unique, it could be operated manually by a gunner or automatically by a solenoid switch that fired the guns when an enemy plane crossed the sight. It was also the first American turret to have a plexiglass dome that protected the gunner from the wind and cold. The Sperry Ball turret was one of the most recognizable and iconic power turrets of the war, it was a spherical enclosure that could rotate 360 degrees and had a remote sighting system. It was mounted on the belly of the B-17 and the B-24 and had two 50 caliber machine guns. The gunner had to enter the turret from inside the plane and then curl up in a fetal position to fit inside the cramped space. The ball turret was very vulnerable to enemy fire and flak 
and the gunner had to rely on his crewmates to help him get out. The evolution of British power turrets. The British were also innovative in their turret designs, especially the Fraser Nash Company, which produced most of the power turrets used by the RAF. The Fraser Nash FN5 was the first power-operated turret to enter service with the RAF in 1937 and was used on the Wellington and other aircraft. It had two 303 machine guns and a hand-cranked mechanism. The Fraser Nash FN20 was the largest and heaviest turret ever fitted to a British bomber, with four 303-inch machine guns and a hydraulic system. It was used on the Lancaster and the Halifax and could fire up to 1,200 rounds per minute. The Fraser Nash FN50 was a streamlined version of the FN20 with two 50 caliber machine guns and a faster traverse speed. It was used on the Lancaster Mark III and the Halifax Mark III. The Fraser Nash FN150 was a rear turret for the Mosquito with two 303 machine guns and a pneumatic system. It was one of the lightest and smallest turrets ever built. The Fraser Nash FN5 was derived from the French SAMM turret, which was tested on the ferry battle in 1936. The FN5 had a simple control system that used a hand wheel and a trigger to move and fire the guns. The gunner had to wind the hand wheel to rotate the turret and pull the trigger to elevate or depress the guns. The FN-5 had a limited field of fire and could not traverse past the tail plane. The FN-5 was also prone to jamming and freezing in cold weather. The Fraser Nash FN-20 was a development of the FN-5 with a more powerful hydraulic system that allowed faster and smoother movement of the turret. The FN-20 had four guns instead of two and a reflector sight instead of a ring and bead sight. The FN-20 also had a gyro stabilizer that kept the guns level when the aircraft was banking or pitching. The FN-20 was the standard rear turret for the Lancaster and the Halifax and was also used as a dorsal turret on some models. The FN-20 was very effective against enemy fighters but also very heavy and draggy, reducing the speed and range of the bombers. The Fraser Nash FN-50 was a modified version of the FN-20 with two 50 caliber machine guns instead of four 303 machine guns. The FN-50 had a more aerodynamic shape with a bullet-shaped fairing and a smaller dome. The FN-50 also had a higher traverse speed and a new electrical control system that used a joystick and a trigger. The FN-50 was used on the Lancaster Mark III and the Halifax Mark III, which had more powerful engines and increased bomb load. The FN-50 was more accurate and reliable than the FN-20, but also had a lower rate of fire and a shorter range. The Fraser Nash FN-150 was a special turret designed for the Mosquito, which was a fast and agile bomber that relied on speed and maneuverability for defense. The FN-150 was a very small and light turret with only two 303 machine guns and a pneumatic system. The FN-150 was mounted on the rear fuselage and could be retracted into the aircraft when not in use. The FN-150 had a limited field of fire and was mainly used as a deterrent against enemy fighters. The FN-150 was also used on some models of the Bowfighter and the Hornet. These examples show that the British power turrets evolved to suit the different needs and characteristics of the bombers they were fitted to. The Fraser Nash Company was the leading manufacturer of power turrets in Britain and produced some of the most advanced and effective designs of the war. Turrets were a complex and fascinating technology with many variations and innovations. Turrets were not a panacea for the bomber and that they had many drawbacks and limitations. Turrets were vulnerable to enemy fire, mechanical failures, and human errors. They also added weight, drag, and complexity to the aircraft, reducing its speed, range, and payload. Turrets were a trade-off between offense and defense, and often failed to achieve either. Turrets were a product of their time, and a reflection of the challenges and aspirations of the air forces and manufacturers. They were a remarkable part of the history of aviation and warfare. More videos on turrets are available on this channel. You find them via link in description and the pinned comment. Thank you for watching this video, and don't forget.
to like, share, and subscribe.